This is a video um, in reply to some of the questions and comments that I got on a V12 Jaguar engine removal video that I did where the engine had lost oil pressure. There was quite a number of questions um, which I got. Um, so what I did, I went through the list of all the questions and so uh, what I intend to do now is just go through them all one by one rather than read off the sheet. I wrote them in here, so I, I put my answers to prompt me to keep me online, otherwise I'll start all rambling too much. Um, first of all, um, yes, I'll take a video of the engine running for you guys that never heard it running. Sorry, I just hear stuff like that all the time, so I don't really think of it. But yes, I'll make a video of it making a noise, um, just to keep everybody happy and let you know what one actually sounds like. Um, the next thing was, would I do the repair the same way if it was my car? Well, yes, I would. Um, that's generally, generally the criteria that I try to work to. Um, if I would do it on my car, I'd do it on yours. Um, not everybody has a ton of money to spend, uh, and other people have way too much money to spend. So that's the criteria that I work to. If, it, if uh, that's something I would do on my own car, that's what I'd do on yours. Um, Yes, I work on my own. Um, I don't have anybody else working with me. There was a time 20 years ago I had 10, 15 employees, um, but not anymore. I just work on my own. I find it a lot easier. My shop isn't that big to support and have enough room for two guys working away. I've only got one hoist and one other bay. So uh, I, I'm too old to dash around. I just, uh, just do my work and I just work on my own. It's a lot easier. Um, occasionally I have to bleed something if I get really jammed up trying to bleed it because a lot of times I use a vacuum system to bleed stuff uh, I get patty uh, the wife to press the pedal but she doesn't like doing it because I swear a lot apparently um, guys are asking or saying that they would put a Chevy engine in instead of the Jaguar uh, this is a personal choice um, not something I would do and I wouldn't spend some guys money doing it, it's not a job I would want to do, I would uh, say no. Um, if somebody asked me to suggest that, I would say no, I would fix the, uh, I would fix the original engine, um, or fix an engine, another Jaguar engine to put in, whatever, but I wouldn't put a Chevy in a Jaguar. I have driven cars that have got Chev engines in them, and to be honest, I was quite disappointed, the performance wasn't as good as everybody thought it was, and it just, no, um, but that's my personal opinion. Some guys that aren't familiar with Jaguar engines and are in kind of uh, out of the comfort zone working on them, but are really comfortable working with Chevrolets, fine, I can see that. Put the Chevy in the engine, you know. So to me, it's a personal choice. I'm not bothered either way, but I won't fix one with a Chevy engine in, and I won't put one in a car for somebody. Um, anyway, that's that. Uh, Somebody asked me about the heads on the V12. The V12 is a flat, it's called a Heron head. It's flat, so the bolt of valves are in off the top, usually they're for a single overhead camshaft, which is what the V12 is. The uh, straight six uh, Jaguar, uh, the 3.8 and the 4.2 and all them, is a double overhead cam, and they have a hemispherical head in them, which is why the motors went so quick when they were first built. Um, hemi heads are a lot better than Heron heads, but again, uh, it's getting into gas flow and into uh, uh, engine efficiency and volumetric efficiency so which is a whole other subject but yeah those two heads are different the ones on the V12 the ones on the uh, straight six um, cooling problems yes the V12 do have a cooling problem because it's a whopping great big engine they carry almost three gallons of water or coolant um, the coolant is circulated through to, um, to help cool the oil as well in the oil cooler. If you remember looking at the video, they all run through the same thing. Um, don't overeat a V12, don't even think about boiling it because it will cost you uh, the effort of taking the heads off to repair all the valves and the seats and sometimes the seats come loose in the head because they boil. The six cylinders do that as well. Um, right, some guy asked about Stromberg Arboretus. Um, I could complain about uh, Stromberg Carburettes forever, 
but unfortunately they come on the car that's what was available uh, basically that's what's available now if I was going to go with a different carburetor setup I would put up um, a set of Webers in uh, 40 DCOEs for each two cylinders so we'd have uh, six Webers on it three each side be really good except I'm not sure it'll fit under the order of an E-Type it'll fit under the sedan I think but I wouldn't swear to it and I don't really think I want to put a big bulge in the order to get the carburetors in um, but that's what I would do that's what I'd like to see um, but I haven't met anybody yet that wants to give me enough money to do that to a car so I'm stuck with the Strongbergs um, they are a shitty carb, yes, you can't adjust them very much, either they work or they don't. Um, when they work they're okay, um, when they don't work they just chuck them away and get another one or try and fix them. So I'm just stuck with Strombergs and that's the end of it. Um, difference between some of the engines, they were talking, some, some guys were asking me too, uh, or talking about using the injected engines for the V12s. All the later V12s in the sedans are all injected uh, engines now, fuel injected. The early ones have got the uh, infamous Strombergs on them. Um, the two cylinder heads are slightly different. The setup on the engine and the engine management system obviously is completely different if you've got a um, fuel injection system. Um, they've also got more pollution controls, um, which is part of the problem with Stromberg, but they've got more pollution controls on the uh, um, uh, injected ones than with the carburetor ones. Also, there's a big difference between the engine that's in the E-Type and the one that's in the uh, sedan. The one that's in sedan, in the sedan, has got a completely different oil pump, uh, sorry, oil pan, and it's got different uh, stuff on the front. Uh, the way the uh, alternator and some of the other stuff is mounted is different. The water pump's the same, but there's a lot of casing on the front that isn't. The oil cooler is separate and goes underneath the bottom of the radiator, whereas in the E-Type, there's no room for that. That has to go into the oil pan, and it's worked uh, as an intercooler with the, uh, with the water. So um, to exchange one engine for the other is exactly what I was doing, except the, carb the carburetted one was the early sedan one was a V12 that I was using that's why I bought it when I bought it I got all the carburetors with it and I got the engine complete ready to go supposedly to drop into the car that was my initial uh, my initial thing um, but to change it I'd have to change all anyway I'd have to change all the oil pan all the stuff on the front um, I'd have to do all the labor I had to do to get down to the engine so uh, to, to be able to put it back in the e -type. Um Now this is getting to the point uh, that everybody keeps, well not everybody, but some people keep going on about which is the crankshaft. Um, people seem to think for some reason the crankshaft can't be re-ground, which I, I, don't, I didn't buy into in the first place, but anyway. Um, people say it can't be re-ground because it's tough rided Well that simply isn't true. Where that comes from um, well, first of all, to qualify this, I talked to a chap in England who rebuilds Jaguar engines. He knows more about Jaguar engines, uh, the straight sixes and V12s, than I do. So I talked to him, and he, he re-grinds the cranks on a regular basis. I mean, after all, I'm just a, a general mechanic. I do all kinds of work. I do transmissions, suspension. I, I do a, I'm called on to do a lot of things. For the past 40 years, since he was trained in Jaguar factory to rebuild the engines in the first place, that's all he's done for 40 years. He's reground the cranks many times. The fact that Turf Rider doesn't make any difference, um, you can still grind them. Um, Van der Waal apparently um, still do, as far as I know, make bearings that go oversize uh, 10, 20, 30. Um, so that's some good authority. I'm quite happy that he tells me that because I thought that was the case in mind. Just to make sure that in North America we're not doing that and everybody else is, I phoned up a chap in Toronto that um, I had cranks done with for the past four years. I've been sending cranks out there. Um, not too many of late because I don't do as many as I used to. Um, I talked to him and I remembered now that back in the... Uh, 80s, mid 80s, I did have a crank for a V12 reground, and he in fact did it. I talked to him, um, he's run that again, the company, for over 40 years, and he grinds uh, V12 cranks more so in the past than he does now, but he says it's perfectly acceptable to do it. 
And the point was, what he told me too, because we, we had quite a conversation on it, that the turf riding cranks were tried also by Honda. Honda made uh, turf riding cranks for a while, and it was the same thing. They were called upon to uh, regrind those. They weren't supposed to, but they regrind the crank and got new shells for it, and it was fine. I think where this story uh, stems from, or these thoughts that everybody else stems from, is the fact that um, I think, and perhaps in the manuals, I can have a look. I've got one lurking around somewhere for a V12. But in the manuals, it talks about the cranks being turf-rided and not uh, being needed, or they shouldn't need regrinding. And I think you better go back and read the wording for real, because if there's a should, maybe, could be in there somewhere, that means it's not written in stone that you can't regrind them. To be quite honest, you can. Um, so if I'd have got into the engine and took the crank out of it, I would have took it to the shop in Toronto anyway and asked them if they could have regrind it. I would have discovered, yes, okay. So as far as I'm concerned, the stuff qualified that I've got says that you can regrind the crank. The stuff you're getting off the internet says it isn't. Sorry, don't believe it. I believe the guys that I know. So, if, again, if you refer back to the video, when I looked at the video, I, my whole problem was no oil pressure. So when I referred to the oil pump not working, I looked at one of the shells, or a couple of the shells, or the bearings, underneath the bottom of the engine. When I took them out, they were brass. Brass isn't good. Next stage after brass is trash in the crankshaft, so I've got brass in it, so I'm not sure the crankshaft is in good shape. Um, when I got the engine, the uh, replacement engine, first thing I did, uh, even after I discovered the valves, in fact before I, st I did a leak down test on it, I cranked the engine to see if I got oil pressure. I got 40 pounds. So I know the replacement engine that I've got has got a good crank in it, good bearings, I don't have to deal with any of that. There's also another issue with the original engine, it was burning oil in the back right hand cylinder. It was doing that for quite a while. Um, so I know the linings are, or the liners are getting worn and the pistons are getting worn. Um, so anyway, what I did, seems how most guys, uh, there was a, a bit of a few comments and a bit of a remarks that I should have uh, rebuilt the engine. So I'm assuming that a lot of the guys that are saying this are not that familiar with Jaguar engines or costs. So what I did, I went through um, a Jaguar to... Uh, price it all up obviously i did that before i decided what course i would take and i also priced it up for a chevy um now the chevrolet engine <coughs> i did a apples to apples i priced it for gaskets gaskets and seals pistons and the forged disc top type that go in the jaguar the main bearings oil bear the main bearings and the uh, big end bearings i pressed i check the oil pump the timing chain and sprockets that's what i it was a kit you could buy a kit for a chevy v8 350 that's what i priced exactly the same parts that i would need for the jaguar um, the price of those came to 650 bucks american all the prices american even though i'm canadian i put the prices in america so it's 650 bucks american for the complete kit that was pistons uh, bearings gaskets the whole bit if the crankshaft was knackered in the Chevy, I could buy another one for a remarkable, I couldn't believe this one, 267 bucks and I walk away with a brand new crankshaft. This isn't reground, this is a brand new one. So as a comparison now, um, I'll give you the prices of the Jaguar because um, we've got to do apples to apples. You want to do a comparison and you want to know why I walked away from rebuilding the engine and put the used one in. Um, first of all, the main bearings on their own are 80 bucks. Uh, the big ends are $97, so we're close to 200 bucks just for the bearings. The oil pump is a whopping $1,625. I'll say that again $1,625 for an oil pump. The guide sprockets and chains from both my camshafts, my intermediate, the one in the bottom, all that stuff, $681. The piston and liner set, I can't just bore it and put a piston in because the piston and liner is the wet liners inside the, uh, uh, inside the block, which also presents problems. I have to buy the pistons and liners together. I've got to get 12 of them. They come to $1,416. I'll say that again, $1,416. All the gasket sets were $227. 
So the, all the parts together for everything is 4,118 bucks or 120. So it's over $4,000 for the parts compared to the Chevy, which is around about 800 bucks if I throw a crank in. So there's one thing. To rebore the block, it's mostly machine cost, probably cost me about 10, 12 bucks a hole. And um, putting in the pistons, no big deal. Same with the crankshaft, getting the crank ground, it's gonna be in the hundreds getting that done. Um, so the assembly time is not very much maybe eight hours let's say some of you shabby guys are probably laugh and say you'll do it in 20 minutes which you probably could but i'm just saying let's assume it's eight hours for the jaguar to put the liners in all the liners have to be lined up so the head fits right across and the deck's done i can't machine the deck flat i've got to make the liners down and sit them all down so they're all flat uh, and watertight and everything in the block not an easy job i've got to clean everything up it's going to take me approximately 30 to 35 hours so uh, a lot more money so with the labor if we fix the labor about 100 bucks an hour the total to go from where i was with the block just to do a short block and rebuild a short block will cost me with labors around about seven thousand six hundred dollars you've got to bear in mind i've got this much money already just to get this far so if you want to double the money just to rebuild the engine, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you think of it on those terms. If you thought of it in the terms of a Chevrolet or a little MGB, I wouldn't even bother. The fact they didn't have oil pressure, I would rebuild the engine. Because the problem is with no oil pressure, you damage other things. So I have to guarantee this engine. I've got, by the time the job's finished, I've got way over 100 hours in this and I've got to guarantee it. If I have a problem with the crankshaft, I'm the guy that's taking it out for nothing and fixing it and having to stand by my work. So I tend to be a bit careful. Also, there is a limit. Even though a guy who owns a classic car, according to some of you, should be able to afford to fix anything. But you know what? There's a limit. There really is a limit. And the choice that I had was that I could use the short block, the, the good part of the engine they actually bought. I took the two heads off, chucked them away and well he'd throw them away i mean literally took them off didn't use them and used the heads of the old engine i would have had to take the heads of the old engine anyway to put the liners in and do everything else so when you weigh everything out i'm better off using the short block that i ended up with plus the short block that i bought i paid about two thousand dollars for the engine and it was that was complete i got a carburetor with that i got a lot of other stuff by the time i'd um discussed it with the person that I bought the engine from uh, the price got reduced to a thousand dollars because as far as I was concerned I was buying a short block so I paid thousand bucks for the short block the extra money went into the price or the time taking the heads off the uh, second engine that I got that was not very good so but all in all I paid a thousand for a short block and what I did was put the short block into the car even if I rebuilt the engine I would have had to take all the pans off all the stuff off that I had off the engine already. If I had to rebuild the car, I would have had to do the same, put them all back. Whichever way you look at it, that was the easiest way to go. And it saved me, I figure, about $7,000 US, which Canadian gets close to $10,000. That's a big chunk of money just to turn it into a rebuild engine or keep the same number on the block. And incidentally, I kept all the parts. Um, I even kept the crankshaft, I kept everything. So, that was that. So if you think that I should have gone into the job for another $7,000 and uh, tried to uh, get the owner to pay for it, well, I wouldn't pay it, so I don't see I, why he would. Um, a guy wrote to me from Australia, the land of Oz, where the kangaroos are, and he um, suggested <coughs> or asked me about a dry sump system, and he also asked me about pressurizing the oil system. So, um, just to explain a bit on the oil system for people that aren't, or for guys that aren't familiar with a dry sump or pressurized systems, what, what uh, the chap from uh, Oz was talking about was a, a regular oil system um, gathers all the oil in the oil pan, that's where all the oil stays, in the bottom of the motor. An oil pump picks it up out of the um, oil pan and then circulates it around the rest of the engine through the journals, through the bearings, up onto the cam gear, everything else. When the oil comes out of the bearings, 
then it finds its way back down through the engine and goes back to the oil pan. So all the oil for the engine is contained inside the oil pan and it's circulated by the pump. With the dry sump, um, well first of all one of the problems with that is the fact that you've got all the oil in the bottom of the oil pan. It gathers heat, if there's a fair amount of oil, which there is in the V12 because it's uh, close to a couple of gallons, um, it's quite a lot of oil in the bottom of the pan. So even the bottom of the oil, uh, oil pan is ribbed to try and keep the oil cooler. It goes through a cooler or an intercooler with the, with the water and the radiator to keep the oil cool. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of reasons that it's not that great to keep the engine oil pan full of oil, uh, especially hot oil. So that's one of the downfalls of um, a regular system. Now a dry sump system is where the oil is still collected in the oil pan because it's gravity fed from the rest of the engine. When it's been used, comes out of the bearings, it feeds its way back down. It's not under pressure, it just comes down under um, uh, gravity. So once it goes into the oil pan, a pump picks it up out of the oil pan and there'd only be maybe half a pint or a pint in the bottom of the oil pan if that. So it pulls it out and it puts it into a reservoir that's kept on the firewall or um, the bulkhead um, or on the inner fender and it's a separate tank completely away from the motor so the motor now isn't after having to deal with hot oil constantly being in the bottom of the engine so it helps the engine stay cooler another one of the re reasons you can do that or it's better is because now the oil pan can be a lot shallower it's not carrying two gallons of oil be a lot shallower means means you can drop the top of the engine the engine at height is not so uh, prominent which is handy if you're trying to keep the front of the car sloped or else if it's a rear engine car you at least you'll be able to see out the back window also it gives you more room on the top for induction stuff like Weber carburetor as I was talking about earlier would go on a V12 like a Ferrari uh, they're dry some I think so that will help the height of the overall hen or overall height of the engine to it to go down a bit so the dry sump goes to the side to get the oil back into the engine once you've pulled it out of the oil pan and put it into the reservoir there's another pump there's two pumps on it takes it out of the reservoir and then puts it into the uh, engine on the pressure side which is the journals the bearings all the stuff on the gear on the top then as it goes through there again it goes through that gravity takes it down to the bottom into the oil pan the oil pan gets collected put in the reservoir that's on the bulkhead so the whole thing's separate so that's called a dry sump system one of the other advantages is with a dry sump there's no oil to come up and hit the crankshaft when you're cornering or going over bumps or the crankshaft catching it anyway um, which is called windage which happens if there's a whole pile of oil in the uh, oil pan that's what happens if you remember on the video I pointed out there was a windage tray to stop the oil coming out and getting in the way of the crankshaft because you lose quite a bit of brake horsepower if you're uh, churning up the oil plus you get froth and you get all kinds of other problems um, but for a regular engine or a fairly medium or low performance engine it's not really a problem now the third thing that we was talking about which is pressurized is something else again guys that go racing um, use this quite a lot it's a good method of lubricating the engine uh, or having oil pressure in the engine before you actually crank the engine because the engine to get oil pressure on both the dry sump or the um, uh, wet sump type car or engine is only present when the oil pump is turning. In other words, the engine's got to be turning over for it to get oil pressure. But when you leave the car for six months, come to turn a car, or if you crank the engine, the engine at the point of cranking has got no oil pressure. If it takes a while to fire, you might get oil pressure but most cars now especially with fuel injection bing, we light up straight away so initially when it starts there's no oil pressure you wait for the light to go off if you remember some of you guys that drive old British cars you could wait for quite a while for the oil light to go out and this is because there's no pressure in the, in the crankshaft or in the journals when the cars are left sitting for any amount of time um, and when they're really clapped out they're knocking anyway and there's no oil pressure so uh, one of the ways you can address this is by a, an accumulator, an oil accumulator. That's what they actually call it here. Um, what it is, it's a cylinder and it's almost like a, a water tank in your house. It has the, uh, where the water's under pressure and it's pumped in from a well outside. 
Um, I don't mean the water tanks in the British houses that are up in the attics. I mean, uh, it's one that's a pressurised cylinder. You've got a diaphragm in it, you've got air on one side, water on the other. Except in this case, it's oil on the other. So it's a cylinder, it holds a litre, anywhere from a litre up to three litres of oil. With the diaphragm in the centre. You pop it up with the air pressure on the back of it, you put maybe 25 pounds or 30, 40, whatever poundage you want in it. You put that, so you've got air pressure on the back side of the diaphragm. You can do that with a Schrader valve, which is the same as the valves that are in the tyres for the cars. You put in the pressure, the pressure is then at 25 pounds, let's say. You start up your engine, and your engine then accumulates the oil in the accumulator. It pushes oil in, once it gets up to 25 pounds or more, it compresses the air. The poundage goes up, it goes up to 25, it's 25 pounds when it's empty, so as you move up, the pressure will go up, so the oil pressure to push it in. You eventually fill the accumulator if you're up to 70 pounds. It'll have 70 pounds pressure of oil, maybe one litre, inside the accumulator. <coughs> Something goes wrong with the engine and it loses oil pressure, which is uh, probably quite often in a race car. The accumulator will dump or keep the whole pressure of oil for a couple of seconds more, which will give the driver time to stop the car, or stop the engine, should I say, or take some kind of... Uh, precaution so that the damage is limited um, so it would push oil because it's under pressure it would push oil back in and in through all the galleries and keep the engine under pressure oil pressure if you go to start the engine um, on the accumulator there's usually a valve on the bottom so you start up the engine you accumulate your oil in the accumulator you turn it off and then you can go away and you can come back two or three months later you turn on the accumulator that will pressurize all the oil that's in your system i'm sure it'll only last for the amount of time it takes for the oil to come out <coughs> excuse me for the oil to come out but you then have enough time to crank the engine and start it up and you've got oil pressure immediately so i think what the guy was suggesting was that with the v12 you put an accumulator on it then when it idles and the pressure drops which v12s are notorious for the pressure will drop to maybe one or two pounds an accumulator would um, keep the pressure up by pushing the oil back into the uh, into the system. The only problem I can see with that is, um, first of all, I don't know how long it would last, three litres going back into the engine, because uh, sometimes if you're stuck in a city, a city of Toronto or Buffalo or New York, wherever you are, uh, you tend to get stuck in traffic for quite a while, a little bit more than two or three minutes. And I've no personal experience of how long these accumulators last for. I'm assuming it's only a couple of minutes. Um, I guess you could rev the crap out of the engine and fill it up again, um, but I don't know if that's really uh, the best way to deal with it. But it's a good idea nevertheless. I think what the problem is with the V12 is there's not enough volume of oil when the engines are idle. I think that's the basic problem. I don't think it's a lack of pressure. The pump's fine. It's a gear pump. I'm not going to don't have any problems getting pressure out of it unless it's completely worn out as the one that I took off was, but I think the volume isn't there. Um, I don't think it's big enough. That's the main problem. Um, it's been something that dogged the V12 Jag engines for a long time, lack of oil pressure. Um, I used to look after about six or seven of them when I was in Toronto, all the same. As soon as you went on idle, oil pressure gone. If you got 10 pounds, it was a good one. Um, so the, the volume I think is a problem. But anyway, I can't address that. I can't get a high volume pump. I can't do anything. The pump alone is enough money. As I said, 1650 bucks. Thank you very much. Well, um, anyway, so that's to answer the guy from the Land of Oz. Good idea, but I don't know if the missus wants to get in and out of the car, turning the valve on and off every time. We leave it more than two days. Um, so from a practical point of view, I don't think it would work. But good idea. Um, anyway, that's me. I'm finished talking about this bloody engine. Um, I'm really surprised I got so many uh, people interested in so many comments, which is nice, I suppose. Um, some of them were quite interesting. Um, some of them were complimentary. Thank you very much. Um, that's it. I'm going to do another one on a six-cylinder cylinder head for a Jag that I have to put together. And, uh, of course, I'll do videos on other cars. And uh, I'll see if I get any response of this. If I do... Um, well then I'll do more of them. If you've got any questions, just write them in. I'll put them in the comments. Pretty good. Uh, that's it. Um, you'll have to excuse the shirt. The wife made me clean up. And
thought I looked a bit grubby. So anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. I'm off for a cup of tea. Thank you.